Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Programming Languages group uh, here at MSR, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a tool called Sci that aims to help developers of machine learning tasks <coughs> uh, debug errors in their data. Uh, and this is joint work with various colleagues at MSR and our interns, uh, Alex Chakarov and Shaik Sen. So let me start with uh, an example. So imagine that uh, you want to build a classifier for images of vehicles and animals. Uh, and one could do this by using an off-the-shelf machine learning library, for instance, a library that uh, implements logistic regression. So I have a label set of images uh, which I pass on to the library. And the library learns a classifier. Uh, for instance, the classifier shown over here. And as you can see, uh, and, and this line over here is supposed to separate the vehicles from the animals. And as you can see that this isn't quite the right uh, classifier as it would misclassify this image of the car as a um, animal. And, and, uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I got it on the wrong side. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I, I think I got it all wrong. So in any case, right? So the the what you'd like to learn instead is a classifier, which is the. So I should have put the dashed line before. But what you'd like to learn instead is this dashed line, which really separates the vehicles from the animals, and uh, our object and, and the reason why uh, uh, the classifier doesn't uh, figure out this dashed line in the first place is because. Uh, as far as the training set is concerned, this uh, set of vehicles has been incorrectly labeled as animals. And our objective in this work is to automatically figure out such mislabels in the training set. And one naive way of doing this is to uh, look at uh, labels in the training set, uh, perturb them, that, that is change the labels, retrain, and observe the outcomes in the test set. And there are various uh, issues with this approach. And, uh, for example, uh, the most, most notable ones being that changing any training instance does not necessarily fix the error. In fact, there could be multiple labels responsible for a misclassification in the test set. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, there are an exponential number of such subsets. And also, every change to the training set also involves rerunning the training algorithm from scratch. And this is also computationally quite expensive. Um, and I hope that in this talk, I'll be able to show you that we will be able to tackle these kinds of issues. And uh, before I go on to explain our technique, let me uh, also uh, introduce some uh, very brief notation. So we're going to look at machine learning tasks, which are these triples, uh, where gamma is a, is a training set, uh, delta is a test set, and A is a ML uh, classification algorithm. So the training set consists of these pairs of vectors from Rn and labels from the set minus 1 plus 1. And the test set is similarly defined. And generally, develop, developing a machine learning task consists of two phases, as shown over here. The training phase, where the training set gamma is given to the learner, or the training algorithm, whose output is a classifier H. And this classifier is evaluated in the evaluation phase over the test set. And uh, the performance of the classifier is estimated based on how well it does over the test set. So in our setting, uh, we're given a machine learning task. And um, the user um, of, or the consumer of the machine learning task is unhappy with some outcome, phi of h, where phi is some predicate over the learned classifier h. For example, it could be a misclassification over a test point, x sub t and y sub t. Or more generally, it could be a predicate that basically bounds the number of misclassifications of the test set. And for each point in uh, the training set gamma, what we'd like to measure is the possibility of it being a root cause for the unhappiness or the violation. Right? And uh, the question is, what is this measure or the root cause? And for this, we um, borrow this probability of causation introduced, by, introduced or formulated by Judea Pearl. And let me try to briefly uh, describe what this is in this slide. So for each training label yi, we have a corresponding random variable, capital Y sub i. And the output variable x is some function of these random variables y1 through yn. And this is the structural equation. And let's assume a world or a situation where the capital yi is given values equal to small y's sub i's, where the output is 
x capital X equals small x. So, so this is the world. And what we'd like to ask is uh, whether a particular label y sub i is responsible or the cause for the output x having this value x, small x. And for this, Perls defines this measure, which is called the probability of sufficiency for a label y sub i causing this output x equals small x. And let me try to, that's given by this expression over here, and let me try to illustrate this with the help of an example. So, so what you do is that you consider a, a world where uh, the, uh, the, the, the label for the random variable y sub i has a value different from the current world, which is minus y sub i. And also, the output variable has a value which is different from the current world, which is x equals minus small x. And flipping the value of uh, the label yi results in two situations, a world where the value of capital X is minus small x, or the value of capital X is x. We like to ask the question, what's the probability that upon flipping the label y sub i, you go, go into a world where x, the value of x is restored to uh, cap, uh, is restored to the value x, which is given by the dashed region over here. And this, is, uh, and this probability is what we're going to use as our scoring metric. And I'll connect this notion to uh, the, 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 our notion of debugging in the next few slides. And our vehicle for implementing the scoring system is that of probabilistic programming. So in the next slide, let me quickly introduce you to what I mean by a probabilistic program. So probabilistic program is a regular program with two additional constructs. The first is a probabilistic assignment statement, as the one shown over here, C1 equals Bernoulli 0.5, um, which samples a value from a Bernoulli distribution, which is fair. And the second is an observed statement that conditions values of variables. So the observed statement over here uh, uh, blocks all runs of the program that do not satisfy the predicate specified by it. So in this case, the only valid, the, 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 the value c1 equals false, c2 equals false is an inv invalid run of the program. And the meaning of the program is the distribution over the expression returned by it. So in this case, the, uh, the meaning of this program is this distribution shown over here, where uh, c1 equals false and c2 equals false is not allowed. So as far as uh, going back to the probability of sufficiency, uh, it turns out that you can actually encode uh, the, the Perl's formulation as this probabilistic program. And let me um, uh, go through this program over here. So we'd like to basically fix our attention to a particular label, yi, and ask the question how responsible that yi is for a uh, dissatisfaction or violation of the predicate that you saw earlier, which is phi. Right? And what this program is saying is that the way to do that is to uh, sample a set of labels from some distribution, and that's given by this first statement, mm -hmm. with the condition that the ith label has a value that is different from the current label. And that's exactly the situation that you saw in the blue square in the earlier slide. And then the line number three basically says, with this training set, retrain and get a classifier, and insist that the cl learned classifier does not have a violation uh, on the test point, and that's given by the observe not phi of h. And then what we'd like to do is that we'd like to basically do this thing, which is an intervention, which sets the label of the of the ith training point to the current label, and line number six retrains uh, the, the 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 classifier on the new training set. And we'd like to ask the question: Well, upon resetting the label of yi to the correct value, what is the probability that you get the violation? Right. So this is basically just an imperative way of encoding Perl's notion of probability of sufficiency. And uh, well, if you do inference for this program and learn <coughs> the posterior distribution of phi of h prime, then that's exactly the score that you want to compute. But of course, this is easier said than done in the sense that there are lots of challenges with respect to doing inference over this program. The first challenge is that, well, if you want to sample labels from this prior distribution, you need to marginalize over a really exponential space. And furthermore, we have one such program for every label in your training set, and that can also be quite expensive. And the third roadblock is that inference would have, to have you need to perform inference over this function call A, which is actually the implementation of the training algorithm in the library. So you have to, you, so in fact, A is not some nice closed form expression, but it's actually code that you wrote in your machine learning library. So in the next couple of slides, let me uh, <coughs> briefly say how we tackle each of these problems. So um, 
the first uh, uh, assumption that we make is that 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 there's a very small fraction of the training set that is actually corrupted so essentially what we do is that when we sample from this prior distribution, we make sure that there is a heavy bias towards the existing training set. We are assuming that bugs are rare, and therefore uh, the training set is by and large correct, and small perturbations to the training set are likely to help you fix the error. And the second one is, um, is, is something which is uh, particular to programs. The fact that we write up this probability of sufficiency expression as a program allows us to perform various transformations in a semantic preserving manner. In particular, we are able to transform the, 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 the program that you saw in the earlier slide, this program over here, over which you can do really efficient inference. So in particular, we split up this program into um, a first part, which is, one, which is statements 1, 2, and 3, which is a part which is not dependent on i. So essentially, that part is common to all training points. So if you look at, let's say, n training points, you have one program, psi, for every training point. It turns out that you can share statements one, two, and three across all those programs, and then run statement number four in parallel, which, um, which helps scale the inference. And I'm also assuming here that the inference is quite naive, where we actually do some kind of rejection sampling. So you run the program multiple times. And uh, for, the, for, the, for the part about um, doing inference over the actual implementation of the um, machine learning library, what we do is that we we build simpler models of the, of the algorithm. So we actually look at the code manually, build uh, models, and also simplify these models by looking at runtime values that we profile while running the machine learning library. And, uh, and these have to be done carefully so that uh, certain robustness assumptions are met. So in particular, what we've done is that we've designed these gray box models, which are, uh, well, combination of white box, which is done by way of looking at static information and dynamic information as well. And we have done this for both logistic regression and boosted decision trees. So we've evaluated our implementation, which is quite preliminary, uh, over a uh, number of uh, benchmarks. And we have initial promising results. So here's the experimental framework. So what we've done is that uh, we've taken these benchmarks, looked at the training set, added noise. And I'll say what, this, what I mean by this exactly in, 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 in a bit and then uh, looked at the ability of our tool to recover that noise. Uh, that's metric number one. And metric number two is, uh, as a result of uh, identifying the noise and flipping the labels, we also measured the impact on the validation error. Right. So, um, so let, me, uh, let me focus my attention to the data set, which is sentiment, um, uh, which is the IMDB review set for sentiment analysis. And there were 2,000 reviews classified as positive or negative. And the features were the word counts. And what we did in, in order to introduce noise is to pick a word that appears in 10% of the reviews and set all the reviews that have that word to be negative reviews. So that's, that's an example of systematically introducing noise. And, um, and, and we ran uh, the, our tool both for logistic regression as well as decision trees. And um, uh, as far as accuracy is concerned, in, uh, for logistic regression, we were able to recover around 58% of the noise. And for decision trees, we were able to fully recover the noise. And um, what the next column shows is that for logistic regression, the validation error without the noise was 14%. And upon introducing the noise, the, the validation error was 24%. And upon uh, running our tool, uh, identifying the noise, and flipping the labels, we reduced the noise back to 0.19%. And the same is true with the decision tree uh, uh, column as well. And the time taken to do all of this is not too bad. It's around two minutes. So. And, um, and, and these two graphs basically uh, show that, um, so this graph to the left basically shows that um, as we increase the number of root causes, so essentially what we deem as a root cause, there's a threshold to the score. So for example, if the score is 0 0.3257, then that's what the validation uh, uh, error looks like, and so on and so forth. And what is interesting is that after some point when we keep lowering the threshold, you know, the results get uh, was, which makes sense because the probability of sufficiency for those points is not high enough to be deemed as a root cause. And that graph over there shows uh, how the validation error, um, how the proportion of uh, uh, errors recovered improves as we give more and more feedback. So in terms of um, ongoing work, um, 
we are looking at uh, you know more implementations like SVMs, neural networks, and one disadvantage, of course, with this approach is that uh, with every new algorithm or every new implementation of an algorithm, we are required to look at the code and write the models ourselves. So it would be interesting to come up with a more general approach to sort of automatically coming up with these models. And we've also looked at, uh, we barely scratch, scratch the surface as far as debugging is concerned. As you all know that there, there's, a, there's a wider class of root causes to be explored here, like feature values, incorrect feature values, over and underfitting of data, incorrect parameters, and so on. And uh, we hope to look at these issues as well. And currently, our tool scales data sets with thousands of points. And uh, you know, uh, we need to do more work in order to get our tool to work over larger data sets. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Any questions? Um, so it seems to me that the, the core problem you're trying to address is, uh, in this work at least so far, is label noise. Yes. Right? Yes. But uh, why not just build uh, label noise models on top of the, the existing models that you have, and then you can infer uh, from the noisy labeled data the um, inferred ground truth label. So it's sort of a modification at the end of each of these models. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be a method that a lot of people have tried before. I see. Have you looked at uh, no, I haven't. Sort of no, I haven't, and I'll be happy to sort of take the references from you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any probabilistic classification right. is actually doing that, basically, because at the end it's sort of uh, going to assume some form of probability distribution over the observed label, which incorporates a form of noise, and you could robust robustify that to allow for noise that's very far away from the classification <coughs> boundaries. For that's right. Way. That's right. So, so in fact, uh, the, the, the reason we started looking at uh, these uh, label errors, so to speak, was to see if we could, at the very least, debug these kinds of things. And we, we also have done, uh, have preliminary results for looking at root causes which correspond to incorrect computation of feature values, for example, which is, you know, which requires a different kind of probabilistic model. Uh, Any more questions? Yes? So I, I get the impression you're trying to correct some of the labels, right, that you think were incorrectly labeled. Yeah. Um, so pulling that to an extreme, because it's going to look at your, your learning algorithm, your classifier, and then see which labels are the most inconsistent with it. Pulling that to an extreme, what prevents your classifier from just saying, well, I'm just going to label everything positive and then correct all the labels to be positive. Uh, which is like a form of overfitting. Like obviously, that's one extreme. How do you know where you are? So, so, so one use case, the uh, the way we expect our tool to be used is that uh, we're not going to automatically fix the labels. Essentially, what we're going to do is to show these labels to the user, saying that these are the suspicious points, and the user has to basically examine them and then correct the labels. Yeah. All right. So, thank you, Adita, again. Thank you. <laughs>